we begin with the notion that since God created, creation belongs to him. Then we'll explore the idea that as presented in the pages of the Pentateuch, creation should be seen as God's temple, his holy or sacred place. And then we'll think about humanity's place in that creation. As far as ownership, none of us have any questions about that. Uh, we all read the Bible. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. There's no doubt about it. He made it, it's his. Several things flow from that. Nature glorifies God and God delights in nature, his handiwork. The heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the works of his hands. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and rulers on earth, young men and maidens, old men and children, praise the Lord. Creation glorifies the Creator, and He delights in it. And so, well, we just have to think of, of Job 38 and 39, God calling to Job's attention all the marvelous different things in creation, uh, apparently uh, with a sense of delight in them. And so as we go in the mountains and, and uh, get a few hundred yards, a couple miles off the main road into a, a meadow of wildflowers and revel in the beauty of the wildflowers, or thrill to the bugling of the elk in the, in the Rockies, or go down to the Everglades and watch the Anhinga birds whose feathers are, don't have oil and so they can swim underwater and they spear the fish with their beak and then they come up and perch on a branch and hang their wings out to dry. And then with their beak, they'll flip the, bird, the fish up in the air, open their beak and catch it as it falls head first, and you can see it go through their gullet. Just a marvelous display. And down in the water are the alligators, or further south, the crocodiles. As we see all of that, we are grateful to the owner of this planet for the privilege of living in the midst of such beauty, such variety, such splendor. We're privileged to be a part of the same creation of, of delicate wildflowers and magnificent whales. We're guests on another's property. And as good guests, we have to be careful how we treat it. It's his, not ours. Jared Manley Hopkins uh, wrote a lot of nature poems. This one is one of my favorites, Pie Beauty. Glory be to God for dappled things. Did you see the dappled thing there? I, I've got to tell you where this picture came from. We, uh, some of you have visited Yellowstone, right? And, and you know, as you drive through Yellowstone in the summer, the, you, you'll encounter animal jams where there's one, one little deer or a porcupine or maybe a bear or elk or something and all the cars jam. Well, here was an animal jam and down in the valley there were a herd of elk along the Firehole River. And I knew that around the corner, uh, the, the Firehole River conti continued down there and we could pull off down there. And people were moving down from where this collection of cars were and the elk were getting skittish and they were starting to move uh, to the south. So uh, we went down and my wife and I and our three kids got out and moved out into the meadow uh, about 50 yards from the river, 30 yards, and there were a couple others, one professional photographer with a magnificent camera and a tripod 
and one other person who came out. We just sat down in the grass of the meadow. And sure enough, pretty soon this herd of elk came and they surrounded us. We just sat there. And then as people began coming closer, they moved over and they crossed the river. And we could see some of the little ones struggling to get up the other side, the little dappled sided, uh, there's too much ambient light here, but he's got the spots on his side, the little one here, struggling to get up, but we could see the mothers come back, get back in the river and, and with their noses nudge the babies up the bank. It was just one of those magnificent, awesome experiences in creation that moved us to worship, to thank God that we'd had that experience. So here's, here's Hopkins. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal, chestnut falls, finches wings, landscape plotted and pierced, fold, fallow and plow, and all trades, their gear and tackle and trim, all things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle dim, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. Now, it may take a little bit of thought to work through what, what Hopkins is saying here. One of the basic ideas here, one of the keys to interpreting this poem is, is the title, Pied Beauty. What does it mean if something is pied? Like a magpie, what? Yeah, uh, primarily two colors, two-toned. And he's praising God for the two-toned color, the two-toned beauty, dappled things, couple colored, but he applies that then to humanity. And we go back and forth between doing what's right, doing beauty, and doing ugliness. But that leads into praise God, whose beauty is beyond all change. That, that's sort of the key to interpreting this poem as I see it. Um, but the idea here is creation is God's, and it should result in praise to him. Second, nature reveals something of God's character. Paul says in Romans, that which can be known of God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Creation shows us something about God's character. We can learn something about an artist by looking at the artist's work. We know something about composers by listening to their compositions. Uh, just a simple example. I don't know how many of you are classical music aficionados. Uh, Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony. Uh, romantic era. Tchaikovsky, of course, struggled with, with homosexuality and uh, feelings of rejection, a lot of difficulty getting his support and uh, his, his patronages. And the, the third movement of the Sixth Symphony, most classical symphonies only have three movements. The third movement is this grand, glorious, it ends with a, with a great march in the major key, and then the fourth, fourth movement comes in. That's just a very down, minor, somber. He's, and we say, okay, obviously he's struggling. And he's telling us in his music that he's struggling. The, the art reveals something of the artist. So God's creation reveals something about God. Cities are man's work. Look at them. The wild is God's work. Look at it. And of course, Jesus drew on the natural world to make his points about God. Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Still in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, consider the lilies of the field, 
how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Here's a challenge to you. Some Saturday or Sunday afternoon, um, go to a beach. Hey, go down to Laguna Beach where there's tide pools and rocks or some other beach like that. Crystal Cove Park or, or go up in the mountains. And just go for a walk and say to yourself, everything that I see, I'm going to try to turn into a prayer. And, and, and so you're up in the mountains and you see a squirrel scurrying around, getting seeds, collecting seeds, carrying them who knows where. The squirrel doesn't know where. Squirrels lose half of what they, they collect. They can't remember where they put it. They've got brains that big. Uh, but that spreads seeds around. But God has given squirrels this incredible ability to run way out on the ends of branches and dig into the pine cones and, and scurry up the... And so he said, thank you, God for giving the squirrels what they need to survive in this environment. Thank you, God, for giving me what I need. Thank you for providing for me. Thank you for letting me see the squirrel. And, and so on. Turn, turn what you see out there into praise. Or walk, walk through a park. Or Biola's campus really is beautiful. They've done a great job of landscaping. One thing I've noticed about Southern California, every season of the year, every month of the year, something new is blooming. So every month of the year, somebody's got new allergies. <laughs> but there are these new blooms, they all look different, and they're all these great big, marvelous, flamboyant blossoms. Praise God for the color. Praise God for the insects that pollinate. Thank God for the gift of color, for the gift of sight. Thank God for the blooming, buzzing insects whose instinctive nature makes this beauty possible. Creation reveals something of God's character, and we should praise Him for it. Although John Muir wasn't, uh, in any sense, an Orthodox believer, uh, he says some good things, and he says, In the mountains, free, unimpeded, the imagination feeds on objects immense and eternal. Divine influences, however invisible, are showered down on us as thick as snowflakes. Think you've got some, some horrible problems? Take a trip to Yosemite and spend a day sitting in the valley. Walk among the giant sequoias. Or go to the sea and watch the waves. God's character is revealed to us, and that makes the world valuable intrinsically in its own right, and not something that we ought to toss uh, Burger King wrappers out the window and spoil. Third, God uses nature to bless and to punish. Nature is His. He delights in it. It brings glory to Him. It reveals His character. But He can use it for His own purposes. He divided the sea and He led them through. He guided them with a cloud by day and with light from the fire at all night. He split the rocks in the desert and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He rained down manna for the people to eat, and he gave them the grain of heaven. He rained meat down on them like dust, flying birds, like sand on the seashore. God used nature to bless his people. But the psalm goes on. Again and again they put God to the test. They vexed the Holy One of Israel. He sent swarms of flies that devoured them and frogs that devastated them. He gave their crops to the grasshopper, their produce to the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail, their sycamore trees with sleet. Creation is God's to use to bless or to use to punish. Now, we need to be careful here. I don't think any of us are in a position, unless God speaks unambiguously and clearly, and I 
my theology says that's very, very uncommon. None of us are in a position to say that the, the Banda Aceh tsunami or the Kashmir earthquake or the recent Japanese earthquake and tsunami are God punishing people. I don't think we're in a position to say that the rain we've been having this winter, uh, we're what, about 25% above normal at this point in the season here in the LA area, or the great snowpack in the Sierras is, is, is God blessing us because we're so good. I mean, we, we can't make those kinds of calculations like God's people in the Old Testament could. But over time, God uses the natural world to bring blessing or chastisement to people. Fourth, the kingdom, uh, the world is where the kingdom of God is advancing. Um, I'm going to read some of these passages. I don't know if you have your Bibles with you. But I want to build a case here. Um, in Genesis 1 and 2, and Revelation 21 and 22, the first two chapters and last two chapters of the Bible are bookends. They share a common trait, namely the absence of sin. Sin enters in Genesis 3. Sin is done away with in Revelation 20. In between, we have the line of sin or the line of separation. The central idea of, of death in Scripture is separation. Physical death is a separation of the immaterial soul from the material body. Spiritual death is a separation of the person from God. Now, in the garden, God said, Adam and Eve, look at that tree there. In the day that you eat of it, now this is what the Hebrew literally says, in the day that you eat thereof, dying you will die. Now, using a participle before a verb, the same, the same root, is a common Hebrew way of making the verb emphatic. And so the usual translation is, you will surely die. And that's very legitimate. But as we often know, Scripture has meanings that are hidden there, sort of below the surface. And I take it that what God is saying is, in the day that you eat it, yeah, you'll surely die. But dying, you will die. Dying spiritually, you will die physically. And so the line of death stretching from Genesis 3 to Revelation 20 is a line of separation of the spiritual from the physical. Death is below the line. Life is above the line. And God's program is to answer the question that echoes from one end of the universe to the other after the rebellion of Satan, who's really in charge? Can he get away with it? Satan challenged God's rulership. He challenged his right as sovereign. God could have annihilated Satan and his minions. No problem at all. But he didn't. Instead, he chose to answer the question, who's in charge? by picking one small planet and creating on that small planet people made in his image, but people with much less power and intelligence than the angels and the demons. And through them, God would demonstrate that he is king. And the program throughout scripture of the different covenants is God progressively unveiling to his people his program of establishing his kingdom to answer this question, who's really sovereign? And so in Genesis 9, in the Noahic, well, it begins in Genesis 3.15. Uh, this is sometimes called the Protevangelium, the first gospel, where God is cursing Satan and he says, I will put enmity between your seed, this, the snake, and the seed of the woman. 
I'll put enmity between you. You will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. Now, in the light of the New Testament, who is the seed of the woman? It's a, seed is one of those words that can either be singular or collective. Seed, of course, is Christ. And on the cross, Satan, the serpent, struck a blow, brought death to Jesus, but that was a bruised heel. Because in rising from the dead, Christ crushed the head of Satan. So the first gospel is back there in 315. Then in Genesis 9, after the flood, uh, we find uh, in verse uh, 12 and 13, God said, this is a sign of the covenant I'm making between you, between me and you, and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come. I've set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and all the earth. So God's program is not just with people. It includes all living things, and indeed the whole earth. That's part of the Noahic covenant. Deuteronomy 30. Comes after Numbers. And Deuteronomy 30. Um, this is a very new covenant passage in the middle of the giving of the old covenant. Uh, Moses is, is telling the people in his farewell speeches on the plains of Moab, uh, the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart. What I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It's not up in heaven, so you have to ask who will ascend to heaven to get it and proclaim it to us. Uh, nor is it beyond the sea. No, the word is very near to you. It's in your mouth and in your heart, so you may obey it. This is new covenant language. But then he says in 15, see, I set before you today life and prosperity on the one hand, death and destruction on the other. For I, command, um, for I command you this day to love the Lord your God, walk in his ways, keep his commandments, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you and the land into which you are entering. And in verse 19 he says, this day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you. Creation is in some way a party to the covenant, the covenant of God's kingdom program. Isaiah 1, which is paralleled in Micah, uh, he calls the heavens and the earth. By the way, the, the covenant, some of you may know this, here's a little bit of Old Testament theology for you. Uh, the covenant form, which we find in Exodus 20 to 23, and in the entire book of Deuteronomy, the, the form that this literature is in is called a suzerainty treaty. Have, have you heard that term before? Um, the, the terms uh, suzerain was a Hittite monarch, an ancient Hittite monarch. And the Hittites would make treaties with the nations that they captured. And uh, would, they would write a suzerainty treaty. And the treaty would say, I, the great king, I, the suzerain, promise to do this for you. In return, you will do this for me. Uh, it starts out calling the heavens and the earth or the gods as witnesses. Then it gives a historical prologue talking about the relationship between the suzerain and the vassal. Uh, then it gives the, the, the stipulations. Here's what you've got to do, here's what I will do. Uh, every year you will send me 30 wagon loads of, of oil, the finest olive oil, and 50 talents of gold. And in exchange, I will defend your borders against marauders. 
So it's a reciprocal relationship. That's the stipulations. Then comes a section called blessings and cursings. Uh, I will bless you. I will do all these things for you. If you obey, if you disobey, I'm going to come and destroy you. And then it ends with a section called disposition for succession. How is this covenant going to be continued? And the entire book of Deuteronomy follows that structure. Now, we've, we actually have a number of tablets in cuneiform um, where we have examples of these treaties. And so we know the, the form, the legal form of these treaties. It'd be, the legal form is just like if, if you found a document that said, you know, I, Gary DeWeese, being of, of sound mind and body, uh, do hereby uh, um, articulate my last will and testament. I mean, you know, there's certain phraseology, right, that, that we know is a legal document. This is what the, this legal form, the people would have recognized. God is making a covenant with us as a people. Now, in the culture, in the Hittite culture, the ancient Near East, if the vassal country disobeyed, if they didn't send the 50 wagons of gold or oil or whatever, <laughs> if they started to rebel, then the suzerain would send what's called a covenant lawsuit messenger who would go to the court, the court and the king of the vassal and say, my lord, the great suzerain, the great, the great king says, you have broken the treaty in these respects. Therefore, unless you change right now, this is what's going to happen to you. In Isaiah 1 and 2, in Micah 2, Micah 6, in Hosea uh, and Jeremiah, we have the exact same kind of a legal formula of the covenant lawsuit. And in these covenant lawsuits, as we see here in, in Isaiah uh, chapter 1, and again in, in Micah, as when the covenant was made, God, was, uh, God summoned creation to be a witness to it. We find the same thing here. Um, Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth. This is the way he begins the covenant lawsuit. The heavens and the earth are parties to the covenant. The covenant that, that gives shape to the progression of God's kingdom. Uh, in Hosea 2, we, we find a similar thing. I, I want to look at Isaiah 11. Uh, this is one of the messianic passages. Um, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. You remember this is often read at Christmas time. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, and so on. And then in verse 6, the wolf will lie down with the lamb. When this messianic king comes into his kingdom, this is the picture of shalom, of peace, that will obtain in the natural world. The wolf will lie down with the lamb. By the way, you know that the lion doesn't lay down with the lamb. That looks better in greeting cards. But nowhere in scripture does it say the lion will lie down with the lamb. It says the wolf will lie down with the lamb. I don't know why maybe Hallmark thought it was better to alliterate it, but the wolf will lie down with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, the young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. So in the last days, or in the time of the messianic kingdom, this kingdom program will extend not just to people, but to all of creation. Jeremiah 31 to 33, this is the classic New Covenant passage. Uh, and in there we find specific references to the new kingdom that will be established to its geographical boundaries. And heaven and earth, day and night, the seasons are invoked there as well. The point is this. It's very easy for us as, as Christians when we think about the kingdom of God, to think 
only about people. And we miss the fact that the kingdom of God includes the natural world. Now, we don't go out and preach to nature like St. Francis did, or is alleged to have done, I don't know if she really did. Uh, uh, and, and, and obviously, if you have to choose between saving the earth and saving souls, you save souls. Yeah. Uh, but it's not an either or, it's usually a both and, it's a matter of priorities. And when we realize that God's covenant and his kingdom program extends to the natural world as well as to human souls, doesn't that put the natural world in a different light? Doesn't that tell us something different about creation? Oh, it should. And that serves as a basis for developing a genuine theocentric ethic. <coughs> and then in the Isaiah 65 and Revelation 22, uh, we have the new heavens and the new earth. Boy, all my life growing up, I thought that what happened when I died was I'd go to heaven and that was it. I didn't know much about what heaven was, but it was some sort of an ethereal, ghostly place. And I remember when I realized that the Christian hope is not the immortality of the soul, but the resurrection of the body. That existing wherever heaven is, is not our destiny, but it's the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, N.T. Wright, the great New Testament scholar, uh, former Bishop of Durham in, in England, has said, I believe in heaven, but that's not the end of the world. Uh, it's the new heavens and the new earth. We're destined for an embodied existence in a created order. And we need to keep that in mind. And so, as William Everson says here in his Canticle to the Waterbirds, yet may you teach a man a necessary thing to know which has to do with the strict conformity that creaturehood entails and constitutes a prime commitment all things share. For God has given you the imponderable grace to be his verification, that is, to all created things, including us. This is just a stands out of the canticle to the waterbirds. Outside the mold and certitude of our forensic choices, that you are lesser, the waterbirds, in the rich hegemony of being, may serve as testament to what a creature is and what creation owes. What he's saying here is we as creatures point to who God is by being the kind of creatures God made us to be in the environment God put us. That points to who God is and what God is doing. And that's what I'm trying to say in, in this short section here on, on the theology of creation. We need to understand that what God is doing in creation is not merely giving evidence of his power and deity, not merely showing us something of his character, not merely using it to punish and to bless, but also using creation as a place in which, and as part of, the advancement of his kingdom. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.